Good morning. Now you'll note that I'm all the way over here because we set up these chairs and then you really don't think afterwards, oh yeah, where am I going to preach from? Because you've got lots of factors to take into account. Firstly, the camera has to be there because of the way it picks up the sound to record for the internet for those who do watch on the internet. Secondly, do we really want to be mucking the chairs about and setting them over there and doing all of that? Thirdly, do you really want to look at my face? Nope, my mum is standing, sitting behind a pillar. Um, and I can't even see my wife. Um, and fourthly, I thought, well, you know, it's God's timing. So in this angle, I actually can't see the clock. Because the post is right in the way. So we're all going to have dinner tonight. Excellent. So to those on, watching this on film, I'm going to apologise, but you're going to see the back of my head often. Um, and the camera will pan to prove that I'm not actually talking to myself and making this all up. There are actually people else in the room with me. All wave. Say hi. Be fellow members of the church, people abroad that watch this. So let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you for who you are. Most importantly, we thank you for who we are because of you. And Lord, now as we look at your word, I pray that each of us, each of us will hear something new, will go away transformed, renewed, and more singing in your glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm hoping to get through the whole of 1 Corinthians by August, or by the end of August. So during the summer holidays, as it's termed these days, we will be looking at some of the final chapters. But today I'm hoping that we're going to get through, hoping, this is hope, what's hope? Believing in what's not seen. In this case, it might be hope that you believe in what you're not here, because I'm hoping to get through the whole of chapter 11, but hey, you never know. Depends on where God leads us. So Andy is going to put the words up there for me as we go along, but uh, if you've sort of got the screen back to you, you can pick out your own Bibles and follow along with us. What did we learn the last time? Can anybody remember? We looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Can anybody remember what it was? Good. 110 verse 31. If you're going to do everything, do it to the glory of God. And one of the things we looked at was three things. We looked at the main ethics of uh, the chapters. Does my actions build up another brother or sister? Does my actions further the kingdom of God or does it hinder it? And are my actions about getting my rights or the rights of others? We learned very much that the Corinthians were very much, Corinthian as a city, and therefore then the church were getting this way. It was all about them personally, their rights and what they've got to. And they have forgotten that actually everything they do is to be done for the glory of God. Yeah, do you remember that? So everything we do is for the glory of? Everything we do is for the glory of? Oh, yeah. They're asleep again. See, because, yes, gathered that. The reason I'm saying that and wanting you to shout it is because sometimes I think we need to get this in our heads. Because we believe we live in a city that's very much about your rights. You personally, you have the right for this. I have the right to have this on the NHS because of this. Well, that's not necessarily what that NHS was originally designed for. It's all about me and my personal feelings, about me feeling good within myself. Do you see the difference? And it's, we actually don't realise how much uh, some of our some of the policies that are put in place is about you as an individual. So you can claim it for your rights. And that infiltrates our mind. And we forget that we're not here for us. We're here for God. 
relationship with him, glorifying him, and being glory to others on his behalf. Not about me and my personal rights. It's about the other. And that infiltrates, come on, it infiltrates my mind. Sometimes we forget that. Stuff from what we consider the outside world gets to our thinking. So when we read the Bible, sometimes we read it, it's all about me. And there's elements and chunks of it that are. But a vast quantity is actually also about the other. It's not about you getting everything you want in life. Because you're worth it. Isn't that the um, shampoo advert, L'Oreal? Because you're worth it. I'm clearly slowly but surely not getting that problem. As got pointed out this week and somebody looked behind my head, I think it was Steve, went, oh, look at that. And I went, yes. Because I'm worth it. Thank you. Bless you, Steve. But just that little caption says, ah, because I'm worth it. It's all about me. Nike, just do it. I'm not knocking all these brands, by the way, before we get sued. But I'm just talking about the slogans. Just do it. Oh, because it's just about me. I'm just going to go and do what I want to do and blow everybody else. That infiltrates the church. And this was what was going on here within Corinth. So we're now going to look at chapter 11, and to be honest with you, it's probably classed as one of the most difficult passages to unpack fully, because some of the comments that Paul makes, we really don't know what he's saying. Things like, makes reference to the angels. What's he talking about? We really don't know. But what we do know is from chapter 11 through to the end of 14, It's very much about instructions over public, corporate worship. Okay? So when they met together as a church in Corinth, do you know where they met? Generally on the whole? They didn't meet in a beautiful, glorious building like Holy Cross down the road. They didn't meet in a glorious building in Cyprus with beautiful arches where the sun doesn't seem to stop shining. They didn't meet in this gorgeous building that God has blessed us here at Greenford Baptist Church. Better redeem it slightly. So there's some repair work being done this week and it was just, you sit there going, and the next thing. But they met in houses. Now, I'm not talking a one-bedroom house. They met in what would perceive the wealthier members of the church would give up their house for meeting in worship. So it would be more like in Corinth, a bit of a Roman villa. And we'll go into that a bit later on. So just to give you the idea, and probably no more than about 50 people actually met. That was church in Corinth, or one of the churches within Corinth, okay? So just want to bear that in mind when we're discussing public worship it's not all sitting in chairs staring at the screen or or sitting in a round like this as this is becoming known as it's very very different it was almost the modern day equivalent go into a house and uh, you know there are, there's the 32 inch tv over there and we all sit down and watch that instead oh you'll laugh so it's very different Very, very different. So we need to bear that in mind as we go through this passage. So, verse 2. I'm so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. Verse 2 only. So I am always glad that you always keep me in your thoughts. Now, obviously, what's happened is the Corinthians have written to Paul and said, you know, we always keep you in our thoughts. We always remember you, Paul, and what you've taught us. This is not just a, oh, we must remember Paul. Isn't he a nice chap? Or, oh, do you remember that geezer, Paul? 
I haven't seen him often. I haven't heard from him recently. I haven't had a text from him. Oh, sorry. I haven't had a papyrus from him recently. Not that sort of remembering. It's affectionate remembering. It's more than that. It's a real sense of we've remembered what Paul has taught us when we meet together. We call to mind some of the things that Paul has imparted to us. Some of the customs. It's that sort of saying. You with me so far? So these teachings. Now, teachings in the New Living Translation is best sort of really, they're talking about traditions. Certain things that Paul has said. This is how you you worship in church. When you meet together, this is how you do this, and this is how you do that. Now, in a good evangelical circle like ourselves as a church, we don't like the word tradition. It seems to be a dirty word. Tradition seems to mean old-fashioned, outdated. You will ever see that. Whenever the companies or big policy makers or government want to change something, they refer to the thing they want to change as traditional. They'll use the descriptive word quite often, traditional. What they're trying to impart to you is that it means old-fashioned, outdated, must scrap it, get rid of it, chuck it out the door. I'm glad to say that tradition within a church should not mean always old-fashioned. In the New Testament, Paul means it in a good way. It means it's something that's true. It's steadfast. There's nothing wrong with it. As one of the uh, uh, scholars that I was reading says, traditions, when they do not undermine the teaching of God's word, preserve valid interpretations and or applications of it, are of great value to the church. So it's a case of don't chuck out the baby with the bathwater. It's be very easy sometimes to want to change everything. And we chuck out some actually good, valid interpretations of God's words. Things that are actually true that just stick the same, are steadfast, have not changed in 2,000 years and have absolutely should have no intention of ever changing. If you want to know what those are, come and see me later. I think John 14.6 is a pretty good one. John 3.16, I think there's a fairly valid interpretation of that. Jesus is the only way in John 14.6. He is the only route, in my humble view. So Paul is saying, I'm really pleased that you are holding to some of the traditions that I have taught you. But now he's going to go on and say, well, there's some that you've got wrong. And I'm going to need some clarification on. So we're now going to look at verses 3 to 6 in chapter 11. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it's shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. Right, who so far thinks that's male chauvinistic? Hands in the air, please. Let's go. In an initial reading, let's go. Those ladies who've got their heads covered, well done, you're biblical right now. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? No, I'm, I am, I am, I am. But you read that and you think, what? Yeah? First and foremost, back to verse 3. 
The head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is... I noticed the ladies in the house are not saying that as loudly as they... My sisters, the head... (laughs) Even the men are going, what? That's not true. Okay, this is the problem. This is where, this is one of those key passages where Paul, the Apostle Paul, has been classed as a male chauvinist. But this is not what he's saying. Again, let's remember two things. Firstly, I know that I say that we, Corinthian City and Greenford or Ealing Borough are very much similar in its social makeup, its cultural makeup. There is a lots of similarities. But there is also some differences. And this is where some of those differences come into play, all right? Because Paul is writing 2,000 years ago into a Pacific context, into a Pacific city that isn't quite got some of the same cultural dress standards that we have today. For a starter, I wear a tie. They didn't 2,000 years ago. Do you see the difference? Some of you are wearing shorts. They wouldn't have done that. Shorts, what are they? They didn't exist. So we must bear that in mind. So what is he going on about? Well, there is a slight problem. He's not forming a hierarchy. Let's make this very clear. He is not sitting here making a complete hierarchy and saying, ah, Christ, then man, then woman. Okay, he's not listening it like that. Because if he was doing that, he would literally go, God, Christ, man, woman. You know, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of man, and man is the head of woman. He hasn't done that. He's played, he's pairs up. The head of every man is Christ, which is true because all things, and it was read to us earlier on, all things are created through Christ. So he is the head of man as such. But Paul is actually trying to raise an issue here of physical dress practice that is not culturally practiced outside of the church and he is trying to reflect on the fact that maybe you need to look at what you're doing so when he actually uses the word head it's not really the right word that's being used here head does not mean authority head more means source Source of being, not as in tomato sauce, but, you know, S-O-U-R-C-E. Source of life. And he's looking at the creation account as he reads these passages. As I said, Christ is whom through all things are made. He is the source of life for every man. Amen? We know in creation that God made Adam. And if we believe in the New Testament that that Christ is the source of all things, therefore then that must mean that Christ was there as such. You know, the Son of God was there when Adam was made. Okay? And Eve came from Adam. So actually... In one respect, the source of life, the building material of woman, came from man. The source. And where he's got here, the head of Christ is God, he's saying the source of Christ is God. Now, this is where it starts getting a little bit confusing because some people then say, oh, well, does that mean, therefore, then that Christ, the Son of God, was actually created by God the Father? I.e., that Christ, the Son of God, now, trying to make the distinctions, you've got to be really cautious here because when we talk about Christ, we're talking about the human man, Jesus Christ. When you're talking about the Son of God, you're talking about the divine side. The two are not inseparable, but you've just got to be very cautious because it's very easy to say, ah, Christ was there at the beginning with God. No, he wasn't because Christ is the incarnate form of the Son of God. Do you see the difference? But the Son of God has always been there. So it is true that God 
Christ, the source of Christ, came from God. That is true. But the Son of God has always been there. Do you know why? Because the Father, God the Father, can't be a father unless there was a son. And the Father's always been the Father. So if he's always been the Father, there's always had to be a son. Same goes with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's always been there. It's about relationship. Um, I can see some confused faces. Let me try and put this right. Okay, my name is Warren. Yeah, hi. That's me. My name is Warren. I am the son of Dot and Len. So Dot and Len, when they were married, that was just the two of them. And they were husband and wife. They then had me. They were truly blessed. And they continue to be blessed. And whatever said is true is true. Right, moving on. They then became father and mother when I came along. I then was son. I am still a son, but now I am a husband. And then when we had our daughter, we are now parents. I am now a father. Do you understand? So your status changes depending on where you are in life. But God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were always. They were there before creation. So they've never not been the Father, never not been the Son, never not been the Holy Spirit because of their relationship. Are you with me now? Do you understand it? They have never changed. So therefore then, when it says here that Christ... um, The head of Christ is God. That is true because Christ, the incarnate flesh, came thousands of years later. But the Son of Man still exists. Yeah? Uh, The Son of God still exists. So when he does that in this wording, because Paul's very clever in the way he phrases things deliberately. He's not creating a hierarchy. The way he's put that is saying God ultimately is absolutely first. Then came Christ, then came male and female, and not, or let's rephrase that, then came Christ, then came female and male. But in the creation account, it's Adam first. Why? Well, it's a creation ordination. Ah, oh, okay, we get to that bit later. I knew there was something else in there, and I'm thinking, why is it not there? Four to six. So a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. Remember, the Corinthians are all about honor and shame. They like exerting their individual rights. Again, no different about today. And Paul is saying here about this, should I prophesy with my head covered? Should I not prophesy with my head covered? Am I dishonoring someone? It's not about you. It's about who's in the room. And we'll come to that continually in a moment. But I just want to say this. He's trying to emphasize that we are meant to imitate Christ. He says it near the end of verse 10, doesn't he? In the end of verse 10, he says, I wish you could all be like me and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Then he goes into this dialogue. So what's happening? Why is he going on about women cannot need to cover their head when they're prophesying and later on he says men shouldn't and and all this sort of thing? Well, there seems to be this real... It's dress code. It's about not showing distinction between genders. Paul goes on about the heads being shaved. Women shouldn't have their heads shaved. Well, because that's dishonouring to them. There's lots of lines being, gender lines being blurred within the Corinthian church because it's happening in the Corinthian city. Paul has probably taught them that there is no slave or free. There is no Greek or Jew. There is no man or no woman in God's kingdom. We are all free. 
problem is what appears to be happening, some of the ladies in the church are using this freedom to break away from appropriate dress code. This is where it gets really difficult and this gets really uncomfortable for me. So bear in mind, this is 2,000 years ago, okay? You with me? So for the majority of my sisters here, please don't be offended immediately. Bear with us. It's not about you. It's about who's in the room with you. This head covering, it's probably more a veil. By the way, veil not as in a face veil, but a veil. In Corinth, if you was a married woman or any woman of respectability or, you know, was unmarried virgin, i.e. you was not a temple prostitute and you wasn't a mistress of some wealthy uh, Corinthian business person, you would walk around with your head covered as a mark of modesty, a mark of, not so you're not seen, but it's actually there to protect you. Bear with us. It's to send the right signals to people in the street. If you're married, we tend to, in this country, wear a ring, don't we? So if you're married and you're wearing a ring, you're telling other people, I'm married, I am not approachable for that sort of thing. You can't try and chat me up. As much as it might appeal to my ego, don't come anywhere near me. It's that. You're trying to send a proper signal, aren't you? Mine's been super glued in place. It can't come off. And it has a chip in it and an electric shock machine. I'm kidding. Okay. Anyway. And that's the sort of signal. So you can send those signals across. I mean, today, when you wear certain... Anyway. If men wear really tight, if they're really fit and... and, and got the apps in all the right places, and mine are all in the wrong places. Um, but if you're wearing a really tight shirt, you're sort of saying, I'm really proud of my body, check me out, yeah? It's that sort of thing. So you would wear this head covering. If you was a, a temple prostitute or a mistress, you would actually not. You wouldn't have that. So everybody know what you did for a living. And if you've been caught in adultery, or you were a mistress and you've been caught out, you would have your head shaved. So it would be totally dishonoured. You would be shamed and you would be forced to walk around with it like that. Bear in mind, 2,000 years ago, this is a culture of, okay? And also what was going on in Corinth was, do you remember when we talked about uh, effeminate men many chapters ago? It was, turns out, from what they could tell, that these feminine men, men who were trying to be more female, were actually wearing exceptionally long hair. And hence why, a bit later on, he talks about that as well. So there was a real gender crossing going over, and people were getting confused who's what and who's where. And also, if a married woman walked outside in the city with her head uncovered, she would actually be shaming her husband as well. So it wasn't just about her, she would be shaming her husband. Also, you ready for this? Back in those days, a woman's long hair was seen as a sexual item. It was sexually arousing for men. Long hair was seen then as sexually arousing. Because you're worth it. <laughs> today in the West, I can only talk about particularly, but you know, today in the West, it's, it's other parts of the body these days. which tends to be something along the lines of breasts, bums, and legs. Generally on the whole, is it not? Look at all the advertising. 
And for the men, or for the women, for the men, seems to be if they have got tight abs, pole dark looking features. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, where have you been for the BBC TV series? Or your Chris Hemsworth and Thor. Not at all jealous, one jot. I just want the hammer. Anyway. So if you consider the fact that long hair was considered a lustful distraction for men, you can understand now why Paul is saying, when a woman stands up the front to prophesy and pray, she should have her head covered. Because partially, it's causing a distraction for the males. Now I know at this point we say, well, the men should learn to control themselves. You're right. But we're men. And that's no excuse. Because we're filled equally with the Holy Spirit as the ladies. But let's also go back the other way, can we, just for a minute. Let's be honest. Women just find men just as attractive. And can be distracted if a good-looking man is at the front of a church. When I'm at the front of the church, you don't have that problem. But when... But think about it, and let's be honest, because this is the problem. Sometimes there's not this honesty. It's always the men seem to have the problem. No, that's not true. Well, you wouldn't have your Crims Hemsworth, Chris Hemsworth making all this money because they're good acting and good looking featured if you weren't interested, yes? And don't say it's all the women out there because that's not true neither. Good, some of you being honest, thank you. So here we can take a principle of saying, well, I don't want to be shaming my fellow brother. And this is what's going here. And I don't want to be shaming my fellow sister. So Paul is saying, well, you need to actually, you know, cover your head. You need to stick to some of these cultural values. There's nothing wrong with that. Just because you're free, you should cover your head. Because remember, we said to you earlier on, remember we were talking about idols for the weaker person, the weaker believer? You've got to be cautious. It's the same thing here for Paul. It's about appreciating the weaker brother that's in your congregation. If you've got something to pray about or prophesy about, cover your hair. You'll do it outside in the street. Why would you make it any different here? Let's carry on. Verses 7 to 12. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshipping, for man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory, and woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching... I'll be up front with you now. We have no idea what Paul's talking about at this point, all right? So we'll just skip over that now. A woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. Now, this is a key verse. But among the Lord's people... Hello, Lord's people. Women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from a man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Note the key verses there. Said, Paul is not creating a hierarchy. If he's just said, hang on a minute, might have been the first woman came from man. But check this out, every other man in the world has all come from a woman. Yeah? Men? So he's not creating a hierarchy. But he's saying here, a man shouldn't wear a head covering. Remember, this, this issue, why would a man start wearing a head covering? Well, shouldn't wear a head covering because he's not showing God's glory, the image of God, if he's covered up. Now, I could go into a long-winded explanation behind Roman worship of their emperors and their gods that what they would do is cover their heads. 
So if you was a Roman idol worshipper, you would cover your head when you went in to go into the uh, temples to go and worship the Roman idols and the Roman gods. Well, Paul is saying, well, we need to make a distinction between the others because that will look like we're just the same. We're worshipping the same gods that they are, which we're not. Could be that. It could be that some of them are trying to reflect Moses because Moses had to cover his head every time he entered the presence of God. After he came out and covered himself, being in God's glory. But we think this is more to do with, again, just gender attire. And he's saying, don't cover yourself because what you're doing, you're acting like a woman. Don't take this the wrong way. You're acting and you shouldn't do. There is distinct gender differences. And you're hiding God's glory. Man was made from God. And woman came from man. So the men could be really trying to confuse the issue and it's not being helpful. Now it could sound like here that actually the problem is is that Paul is now saying, by the way, man is reflecting God's glory. Women, you're only reflecting men's glory. You don't reflect God's glory. Does that make you feel a little bit less? Is it interesting when we all, by John, were made today to go around and say who we are in God? Who received that, by the way? Who truly received when you was told that you are a little alien angels and God is mindful of you? Do you know there should be a whole load of hands shooting up right now? Who received that? Who received that that you are actually can't believe that God is mindful of you? We will have to try that again. Let's go back to the creation ordination. God made man, made Adam. And out of man came Eve. But it was purely building blocks. Eve was made because God said about Adam, it's not good for him to be alone, is it? He needs a help meet. He needs somebody beside him. So basically, Eve was made to make up for Adam's deficiencies. So women had to be created to make up for man's deficiencies. Yeah, yeah, you can do that a bit louder. Women had to be created because man on his own is deficient. As in, this is humanity-wise, okay? This is not, if you're a single man, it doesn't mean that you are deficient, all right? Bear with me, very cautious. And it also means if you're a single woman, it doesn't mean you're deficient neither. But that's the original creation ordination. But this is why Paul then says, but the Lord's people, nobody's independent of each other. So we're all dependent on each other, whether we're married or not. But in this church, we are together, make up for each other's deficiencies, You know, everybody has a gift that makes up the body of Christ. I can't do everything. You can't do everything. But together, we make up each other's deficiencies. It's a creation ordination. Makes me feel better when I know that I can't do plastering of a wall. Joy can. You think I'm joking? She knows how to plaster a wall now. I think I wasn't meant to admit that. But anyway. So therefore then, it's not that Adam alone reflects God's glory or man reflects God's glory. We all do together. The glory that that the woman reflects is actually to do with the fact that she is created from man, but she's created just from the building blocks. But she still reflects God's glory. And actually, she, I would say, reflects it more because she was needed, because man was just inefficient. And it's about relationship. And so what Paul is also saying is, well, hang on a minute. If God says, here's man, and he needs to be, he's not sufficient on his own, and here's Eve, and she will complement the two, and you then complement each other. Because by the way, it works the other way. Man makes up for woman's deficiencies. The two of you reflect God's glory. But it also means that you need to keep your distinction. 
which the Corinthian church wasn't doing. It was trying to blur the lines far too much. Now, I am not sitting here talking about the fact that only a man can do certain jobs and only a woman can do certain jobs, all right? Hear me very carefully. I am not talking about that. It's got nothing to do with that. But here, it was their way that they were dressing or not dressing, that they were not helping each other, and they were blurring the lines. It was happening out in the city quite regularly. And it was infiltrating the church. So do not blur the lines. You all reflect God's glory. Verse 10 says, For this reason, because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. As I said, to be honest with you, we got no real idea. Again, authority is probably not the best rendition here. I much prefer this. Uh, what they were saying was that maybe she should wear a head covering when she's prophesying or praying because then it shows she is under authority. She's got the authority to do this prophesying. And it's come from God. I prefer this. She recognises that she puts on the head covering to say that I am under the humility authority of recognizing that it's not about me, but it's who's in the room with me. I may be free in Christ now to get up there without a head covering. I might be culturally free, but it's not about me. I've got the authority in Christ to do this, but I've got the humility to say, I want to worry about my fellow brothers in the congregation. I want them to hear the word of God not be lusting after me in my hair. Verses 11 to 12. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Thistleton, I think, wraps this up beautifully. Paul insists that true human relation... Re, really, why do I come across a word that I practice and it never comes out? Paul insists that true human relationality... Paul insists that true human relations entails otherness and indeed respect for the otherness of the other as a human necessary basis for true mutuality and relationally that constitutes what it means to be human. And I am going to just unpack what that means by that and rather than trying to quote it. Being truly human is about relationship. Being truly you is about the other person. It's how you relate to the other person in the room. Being truly human is about being in relationships. Note the phrase sips, because it's not just about husband and wife here I'm talking about. This is about all of us. Being truly human is about being in relationship with God, and here where Paul's talking in the church is relationship with other, the other person. And it's appreciating the otherness of the other person. Nobody in this room is alike. Look at each other. Stop looking at me. Look at each other. You're nothing alike, are you? Even if you're identical twins, there will be still marked differences about you on the inside, about your personality, about the way you think. You're different. And we have to learn to live and work with the other person, their otherness. It's not about you, it's about who's in the room with you. So you have to have respect for the other person. So if you're with a person who's quite sensitive of nature and can be easily upset or distracted because of past experiences, etc., don't be an overbearing oaf. And if anybody says, are you talking to yourself right now, Pastor Warren? No. 
I mean, yes. Sometimes try to appreciate where the other person is coming from. Now, we're never going to get it perfect because we're imperfect beings. But you have to try and appreciate the other person. Plus, if you're over an oversensitive person, try and appreciate the overbearing oaf. It just happens to be who they are partially. Don't maybe sometimes be so easily quick to be offended or upset. You have to appreciate the otherness of the person. Now, it also means we don't not tell each other when we're upset or the truth. As we see, if there's been plenty of lots of experience of the same bad behavior towards me, you say something, don't you? But being a truly human in a truly human relationship is about appreciating the otherness in the other person. The true saying is, you can't please all of the people all of the time. And we see that experience in church all of the time, don't we? I would love to please every single person in this room all of the time. Guess who's the one person I wouldn't be pleasing? Me. But that's not about me. It's about all of us. But we appreciate that we're never going to do that. So we take it the rough with the smooth. Because we appreciate the otherness in the other person. Now, we all might not have go, yeah, I can do that, it's easy. But it's amazing when something taps in an area that you're not happy with, how quickly you suddenly realize, hmm, maybe I'm a little bit selfish. Maybe I'm worried about me. You, you, just a little core. When you go away afterwards and you reflect and you thought, Whoa, what was that about? Oh, I wanted my way. You'd be pleased to know we're not getting through the whole of chapter 11. Because actually, as I've gone on and we're looking at the Lord's Supper later, we really need to go into that quite in depth next week. If you're not here next week, it will be on the internet. Mainly my bald spot, but it will be on the internet. 13 to 16. Judge for yourselves, is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Now, this is where Paul's starting to say, look, think for yourselves. You've just seen what I've just said. Think about it. Don't be offended. Think about it. Because he's basically just told some of the women in, in the church, Oi, what you're doing by having your head thrown off, yes, I know you're free, but you're actually not appreciating the other person. So what you're doing is wrong. Now, at that point, they could be easily offended, couldn't they? They're saying, well, there's conflicting teaching going on here. One minute, Paul, you're telling us that we're free. We could do whatever we need to do. Sorry, Timmy's flashed up. I've got another five minutes yet, Timmy. Thank you. Um, I'm sitting there thinking, 12.45. Five minutes. We're nearly there. That's why we're not going to go through the whole of the chapter 11. Think for yourselves. You may well think, yes, in church I'm free to throw off my veil and, 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 and prophesy at the front. But would you do that outside? What's their answer, do you think? No. You wouldn't do that on the street. You wouldn't walk around without your, your head covering on because you don't want to send the wrong messages to people. You wouldn't do that. And also for the men, isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? We're in a different culture, a different time. This is 2,000 years later. Men have long hair now. So bear that in mind. But back then, if you had long hair, it basically said you're a male prostitute for other men and other things as well. You were sort of almost the male sexual interest of another male who was high-powered in the city. Okay? So let's just bear that in mind as well. 
So having long hair today is not a problem because you're worth it. <laughs> that's just, that's just going to stick. I've just found the title for today's sermon. Right, moving on. So he then called, oh yeah, you're right. Okay, yes, it is disgraceful for me to do that out there. That's disgraceful for a man to do that out there. And isn't it a long hair is a woman's pride and joy? Is your long hair your pride and joy? Whose hair is their pride and joy except for Steve? Whose hair is their pride and joy? Yeah? Yeah, mine was. It's going now. Um, but he's saying, you know, look, we know that a woman's magnificent mane is her pride and joy. It's no different from society's view that your figure is meant to be your pride and joy. A man's physique is meant to be his pride and joy. Yes! <gasps> For it has been given to her as a covering. Her long hair is to cover her shame. Because it's shameful to have shaved head back then. So her long, magnificent hair is wonderful. But she should cover that when she's in the church, when she's prophesying, because she would not not cover it when she's outside on the streets. And then Paul says, but if anyone wants to argue about this, so you can imagine that, can't you now? You can hear some of the ladies really arguing. No, he says, but if you want to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom, no other tradition than this. And then ready for this, I love this. And neither do God's other churches. For me, I felt like Paul was having a real dig. It was real. The other churches appreciate this. Why can't you? I'm not saying anything to trap you or bind you. Actually, I'm probably doing this to keep you free. I simply say this, that if we have no other custom, then neither do God's other churches. And it was the way he titled it, God's other churches. He could have just said the other churches. But he's like sort of saying, God's, you know, who do you belong to? You don't belong to you, you belong to God. You're God's church. It's not about you. So he's saying, think for yourselves, examine what you are doing. And you can be argumentative, but actually God seems to be just adhering to a God-ordained creation command. That man and woman are separate. There is distinctions between you and actually culturally here, you have to hold to them. To appreciate the other and the otherness in the other. So how do we translate that to today? Well, our dress codes these days, within reason, are fairly well mixed up now. Ladies wear trousers, they wear suit jackets, they wear ties. Actually, I just realised men's clothing really is quite boring, really. We just go up to our wardrobe and go trousers, shirt, tie, dum, dum. If Bollers here, he's probably saying, no, I think about it. He probably does, because he always looks really sharp. But actually, we now don't have that sort of gender distinction. But there is a sense about modesty of dress code. Now, hear me carefully. Again, you have to work that through, what that means for you and what that means for others. A couple of years ago, I remembered the fashion being, and I think it's sort of half coming back, is, is for uh, shorts that, well, didn't actually even cover the base of the cheek of the bottom. Yes, am I right? Now, I'm like, huh? Is that what they're called? Hankies, yeah, thank you. I wanted to call it a wide belt, but that would be doing it a justice. That's not the sort of thing I would expect to see here in Greenford Baptist Church. But then again, man wearing a really tight, showing everything. Maybe that's not appreciated for some ladies in the house. Maybe some of our sisters in Christ would not like seeing a man showing all his good bits. I'm just trying to say, and it's very difficult because we are in such a different, multifaceted, cultural being, looking all different dress wear. And if it's a hot day, I appreciate, we're all going to want to come in shorts and a t-shirt or whatever else. Absolutely. Believe you me, I don't want to be standing here with this on today. If it gets any hotter, it's not going to be on. But do you understand what I mean? 
So how do we translate that today? Well, I think for me, what we take out of that has got nothing so much to do with attire and dress code. It's actually to do with about appreciating the other. Let me think about the other person in the room. Let me not talk about me and what I want to wear today. Let me appreciate the other. I remember many years ago um, that, you know, back in the workplace, there was such an argument in my old job about whether we could actually dress down on Fridays. Now, we was always told we must wear a suit and a tie and a shirt. Can we dress down on Fridays? By the way, their version of dressing down on Friday was no tie. Okay? Eventually, it went to jeans and a T-shirt, but that then just, so they, because it worked in an office. But what they then did say, though, but ah, if you've got an external meeting you're going to, you must wear a tie. And if you've actually got somebody coming to a meeting here, you must wear a tie. It was about appreciating the other, because you want them to treat you differently. You want them to respect you. You want them to think business-like when they meet with you. And that was the point. And that's the same for us. When we are with other people, whether it be in church or outside of church, what do we want them to do? We want them to appreciate the other person. We want to be able to say, I'm here for you, not for me. I'm here for God's glory, not for my own. Let's pray. Lord, because you're worth it, and because the others in the room are worth it, Lord, help each of us, each of us, to think about the other over and above ourselves. We do thank you for Paul. We also do appreciate sometimes, Lord, it was talking into another era. So just help us, Lord, to listen to your voice through your spirit as we make decisions on our daily basis. And let us make it in light of thinking of the other. Pray this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.